To me, the bookstore was always in my life. I can't remember a first time in the store. It was a huge part of all of our lives. You know, it was the family business and it was a place that we hung out and uh, a place to work, but also a place to go to. My grandmother and my mother wanted it to be a magical place, a safe harbor a harbor for ideas, a place that certainly a lot of, I think, sort of lost people. Often in society, the people who are marginalized, who feel that they don't belong, I think often find solace in, in the world of books. And those people would come into the bookstore and get a cup of coffee or a glass of sherry and find a place where there were other people like them. When I was in the store, my mother was running the store, but people would come in and say, I knew your grandmother, and now I'm friends with your mom, I'm friends with your dad, and I used to come to the house. And there was this sense of continuum, which was, was really, really wonderful. And people came in, and, and just strangers would come in, tourists, and stay for hours. And, and uh, it, was, it was a lovely, lovely spot. And certainly there was always the smell of coffee in, in Rosengren's and sometimes Lemon Pledge because we had so many antiques. And then my mom would sometimes have incense in the store. And people would come in just to, to hang out. People would come in on their lunch hour, just spend their lunch hour looking at books. We had a candy dish there, which Maury would sneak in at lunchtime because Julia would not let him eat. He had too much sugar. He was di almost diabetic. And he would come in and grab all the candy on the counter and we refill it. And, and Nikki would say to him, now, Maury, you know you're not supposed to do this. And he'd say, well, you're not going to tell Judy, are you? <laughs> I can remember when I was small and would get books, just be in heaven. And I love that feeling of opening up a book, particularly if it's, I think expensive books smell different than cheap books. I know that sounds crazy, but there's something wonderful about opening a book and smelling the paper and then turning the pages. There's a feel to the heavy paper and to the glossy photographs. Books are culture and civilization. Books are just something I don't know. They are just there. They were something that, you know, like food and, and water and, you know, a roof over your head, they were there. Well, when you find yourself in a book, then you don't feel so alone. You've, you've discovered somebody like you in a book, and that's one of the magic things about books is, is they take you other places and they take you familiar places that are very reassuring. I think my grandmother's life was pretty much with the bookstore. You know, it was my grandfather's bookstore, and then my grandfather got ill, and my grandmother took it over and ran it. And I think her her life was in the bookstore. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed is how I would say she was. It, and it wasn't cultivated, actually. She was that way. With the restrictions of her upbringing, which was very serious, Chicago uh, Catholic family. She was a little dowdy. She was cerebral. She was interested in, in things of the mind. So her clothes were sort of old fashioned and she wore sensible nurses type shoes and very little jewelry. Oh, I see her sitting at her desk in the back at the old store with her reading glasses on her nose, probably writing to some publisher. I always thought Florence was a great book woman and very, very with it. And uh, there was a, a kind of vulnerability of sweetness with her. But on the other hand, she could be pretty hard-nosed when it came to something that offended her. And uh, she never really got angry enough with me, but I do know that everybody uh, code the line because if she was angry at you, you didn't like that. <laughs> that was one of the reasons that she, she worked so hard at being successful as a book woman because there weren't many book women. And she was very good at it. And so 
she had a way of organizing and cultivating those people who were important, like Robert Frost and the Knopfs, both in publishing and Robert Frost in writing and this, and she, she kept in touch with them. There were a lot of people who came to Rosengren's from Mexico City, a lot of people from Chicago, Los Angeles, um, big cities, cities with a large reading population. But, but also, particularly during the war, um, there were so many, um, during World War II, there were so many young men from all over the country who found themselves in San Antonio. And if you were of a literary bent and wanted to go hang out with people who were similar to you, there weren't that many places to go. And that's when, when the world of Rosengren's, the family of Rosengren's, really started to be be born. My grandfather was ill, and uh, my grandmother started uh, entertaining people at the house, and there were all kinds of people sleeping on the floor and coming for Friday and never leaving until Sunday night. Florence was giving an autograph party for Lawrence Lenski. Somebody didn't show who worked for the store, and uh, Raleigh asked me if I'd come help, and I said I'd be delighted to. And so I went over and sat through, uh, well, I didn't sit, I worked the whole time. They were never, autograph parties weren't, autographing parties were never easy. They were fun and they were wonderful, but they weren't easy on whoever was, you know, getting out the sherry, the hors d'oeuvres, and counting the books. And so I was tired at the end of that, and Florence and Raleigh, I don't remember who said it, it was Raleigh's pot roast on his little cooker, said, come home for dinner, and I did, and this guy was reclining there on the couch, and she said, this is my son, Frank Figgy, who's home from Mexico, and I said, are you going back? And he said, I don't know whether I will or not. So we ate, and we got to talking, and it was one of those things, you read about them, and I never believed it, but it's true. We talked, you know, very, very late. And uh, then he said, well, let's do this again. Oh, my dad was a wonderful man. He was the smartest man I've ever known. He was the funniest man I've ever known. He was a wonderful father. We were good friends. And, and it was really, uh, he, it was one of the nicest relationships of my whole life. My dad, you know, who's a professional writer, he always used to say, well, that's another chapter for the book. Even when bad things happen, that's another chapter for the book. And so everything in my family, you know, words, the currency of our, of our family back three generations is words. And I feel so blessed to have grown up that way. And that's the essence of what the bookstore was. It was wonderful to watch my mother and my grandmother try to steer people to, to better books. You know, somebody would come in looking for Jackie Collins and, and you know, both of my mother and my grandmother would kind of say, oh, well, we, we do have this, but have you ever read that author? And would you, you know, trying to, oh, and if you like that, then you'd love this, and trying to steer people to better books. The store always had a, a wonderful children's section, and it was something that my grandmother had did, did and that my mother uh, elaborated on, and there were little cute little teeny chairs and short little tables and, and uh, a real interest in, in children's literature. And Bob Tobin once said to me, uh, we now have the wonderful uh, the old municipal auditorium is, is now the Tobin Center. Uh, he said to me once, your grandmother taught me how to read. And of course, he didn't mean literally that my grandmother taught him how to read. He went to wonderful schools and had a wonderful family and a great relationship with his own mother. But he said, she's the one who really got me excited about literature. And that was very nice. He said it much more flamboyantly than I said it, of course. Lots of interesting people came into the store, both when my grandmother was running it and when my mother was running it. You know, really interesting people. And that's why the parties, the, the bookstore parties, when there was a, a, you know, Larry McMurtry always had his sort of coming out parties at the bookstore when he had a new book. The re pre-release parties would happen at the bookstore. And that was the only place that, that he wanted to have them done. And there were a lot of authors like that who, who wanted their pre-release parties to happen at Rosengren's. Rosengrens tried to 
support writers and not just give them a place to to sell their books but a place to come in and hang out and talk about their books to talk about other people's books and and certainly many many writers came into Rosengren's also local writers but also writers from other parts of the world would would come in and, and say oh I've heard about you I want to go to Rosengren's Taxes were too high. The construction on the street, the various no uh, parking blocks that they would create without understanding who, what little shop was on that block. And they all closed, even Joski's closed. Even my good friend Pink Pinkus closed. All my friends went, Toys Especial, everything across the street. Uh, every, every independent closed. We were the last to go. That is a time when the city movers and shakers uh, decided that to bring uh, something in, like a hamburger joint or a taco or any whatever it was, was better than local. And and so yes, it was it was the sense of a bookstore in the community, and the importance of that is lost now, because now that they're all the chains, although the irony of the chains closing is is interesting but we went from the independent stores to the chain stores and now even the chains are having trouble because everybody buys things online but you can't feel the paper and you can't smell the paper if you if you buy online I was sad I'm sadder now with the Amazon thing and everything I mean it just gets worse and a whole library that is uh, you know electronic and no books this this I never thought I would ever live to see It was just an entity that existed, which doesn't anymore. They go other places, except they don't. You see, this is the trick. They do not go other places. They pick up their little iPad or their phone, and they start playing games with little birdies that shoot each other or start texting, in which I don't think anybody in 20 years is going to know how to write. They won't know how to spell. They won't know anything else. They text all day long instead of reading books. There's a whole generation of them out there. But I think that there will be that place, just as there was in ancient Greece, as there has been throughout mankind. There will be a place for people who are interested in words to come physically together that is not just in, in the ozone, in the ether of, of the internet. Nobody runs a bookstore to make a lot of money and just have a business. It, it's a it's an act of love for anybody who's in, anybody who's in the book business will tell you that. One of the reasons to go through all that hard work to do that it was so hard to run the store that one of the things that we were doing as a family and one of the things that my mom continued to do when my grandmother retired when my mother was running the store was to do outreach to the community to say we're here to serve a higher purpose we are here to help people we're here to, to serve a purpose in the community. We're not just here to make money. We're not just taking the easy way out. We're not just doing something facile. And, and certainly everybody who worked in the store, that was, people came to Rosengren's to be there, to work there, to partake of something larger than ourselves. It was authentic. It was individual. It was real. It wasn't run by a corporation. It wasn't part of a chain. And now every road out of every city in America looks the same. You can't tell where you are. You know, there's a Chili's and there's a Best Buy and it all is homogenized and the same. But Rosengren's was evocative of the Rosengren's family. It was our bookstore. It was who we were. It was what we wanted it to be.
I'm so blessed. And, and it sounds a little pretentious, but I think that, you know, the Rosengren family did good, I think.